Hello and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. It is fabulous to be in a world uh, with you right now, holding my hand. You know, I, I, I just I just got out of this conversation with my wife. Uh, it was a conversation, as we clearly set out for it to be, not an argument, not a fight. But no, it's it's actually just a conversation about. You know, I, I've been. Uh, I, I just recently read this book. Of course, it's a book about um, by Wilbur Smith. It was about the East India Company and this. Any, it was, and I was thinking about, you know, Shashi Tharoor is someone who keeps talking about this. And of course, there are a lot of people who've documented this. It's a known fact that there's a lot of exploitation and basically um, w- w- what what happened initially as a trading uh, deal between the U- between England and India became then a mission to conquer and strip. Indians away, uh, strip away Indians' um, pride, you know, national identity, culture, various other things. So, I'm not an, I'm not a historian. I'm just thinking back of how I, growing up, was also conditioned to have this this need of validation from someone. Um, you know, I wouldn't say white alone, but it was someone from Europe or someone from the from the US and there was this need to be accepted and recognized I, even in stand up like if i would do shows in new york or in edinburgh and if i'd get people who were i would say non asian but people who were from the locals coming and laughing i was like wow i've made it so now there's this thing where um even if you take it away from, from music or stand up or the arts and you come into something like fashion or products there's always, you know, you want an Apple phone or you want something uh, which is um, designed in, 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 you know, when it comes to finer designs, you want a Rolex or you want a Patek Philippe or you want diesel jeans or you want like even higher and Hugo Boss suits. So these these brands have left such a mark on us, um, whatever the brand it could be, right? It could be from either end of the spectrum. It could be like buying a G-Shock watch or it could be like buying a Jimmy Shoe pair of shoes or pumps or whatever. Now there's this thing where it was always seen as Indian products were not good. And this is one of those things in the narrative, right? Whatever's made here is inferior. What Indians make is inferior. And this is something that we were told when we were ruled over. And that sort of stuck with us. And even Indians, when we have a little bit of money, will go past an Indian brand and then start buying a BMW or a Merc. Or uh, the aspirations become more... um, influenced by Western brands. Uh, but I feel there is this thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, but I think like now if you look at on Amazon, for instance, there are so many local uh, companies making, you know, noise uh, cancellation headphones and or even say watches, right? I saw some company called Bangalore Watch Company or whatever uh, the name may be. And even say a company like Tata's, which earlier like they had the Indica and the, Indigo, which was, I mean, pretty shitty cars, like it was entire chassis based. And then the Nano, which is, a, but now I think after they sort of bought over JLR, you see the cars having a lot more influence of these uh, better components. And I'm not saying it's the Jaguar Land Rover influence, which of course may be the case, but you have Tata cars coming up in 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 quality um, and, and the perception still is hard for people to go, you know, would I, would I buy a high-end Tata Safari, or would I buy a Range Rover Sport, right? I mean, of course, the price points are different, but I'm 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 just interested to to, to, to how these things are changing. I'm not talking about national identity or these things, but there there is this kind of need. I'll give you an example. Like you buy a fancy flat for whatever price it is, right? You buy a nice in a high end condo or high end apartment building. And the, the, say the place costs you like, you know, five, six crores, if you, that's like almost $800,000, which is quite a lot for a flat. Um, the, the point is the people designing the flat, of course, the person selling it to you will be like, oh, it's great amenities, it's got the... But the person designing it has never seen a flat, which... And it's not just marble or the, 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 the lampshades, but it's the entire the layout, right? There's a certain aesthetic, there's a certain thing that a person who's paying that much wants from his or her home but the person designing it doesn't know so there's a disparity in the kind of person designing and the end consumer um, but now as people who've gone uh, earlier they would go abroad to study 
they would get a degree in one of undergrad degree or postgrad and they would stay there to work for the likes of the amazons and the uh, expedias and the microsofts and whatever the job may be but i feel those people who have graduated now are coming back and setting up um design studios setting up startups or joining companies which are locally um trying to kind of create this new wave or this 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 sense of a, an ecosystem where products services uh from every from across the board from electronics to interiors to fashion to to even something like furniture are locally sourced locally designed and locally made with a higher sense of quality with a higher attention to detail um and in a sense fighting an uphill battle which is re designing not just the design for indian eyes but redesigning the indian mindset towards indian products of a higher quality now and changing this thing going that oh you know what made in india not as good as made in italy right um and i feel that shift is being done by a few people being appreciated by even fewer but i think it's damn fucking important yeah i actually want to talk about autonomous cars today but my mind knows me better than i do and it took me down a different path anyway anyway yeah anyway um i don't know if you have a thought or you have an opinion or you have a counterpoint but of course you can reach out to me you know how to reach out to me we can connect telepathically through our souls today's guest is kevin gary he's a professor of theology he's a professor as well of the philosophy of education now in this conversation we talk about religion the influence of religion the history of religion and and the significance of why this that this continues to play such an important role in society like why, why do we need to understand um and not just ridicule because there's a there's a lot of politicization of religion where it's if you're not one group if you're not part of one group then you're the other you're the enemy you're the other and of course if you're in india you know that that the kind of the, the fine line and also the very thin layer of ice uh when you start talking about religion and how that can flare up but across the globe um there are various kinds of conversations like this around religion the tension um but kevin and i talk about something which is deeper which is why did certain practices why did certain institutions survive so long uh, and what role did they play in a society in shaping in guiding in, in in providing a certain framework to help people make sense of life so it, that that's something we cover but we also talk about boredom and that's a very important thing to understand because we use the word very loosely and don't really understand what goes on in our heads when we are bored so yeah i think you'll have a fun time listening to this because i had a lovely time chatting with kevin gary uh so yeah thanks kevin if you're listening appreciate it and of course if you are listening which you are i'm sure i appreciate it as always you coming in week in week out uh till next episode i will sign off for now and try to figure out boredom for myself but you can listen and understand what boredom might mean for you all right till next week goodbye god bless take care of yourself cheers kevin gary thank you so much for joining me on the soapy rao show appreciate you being here wonderful to be here thanks for having me my pleasure um so you're, you're you you just mentioned before we started recording you um uh, like not being stuck to one discipline as a professor and that sort of lends your interest in the uh, field of theology and philosophy of education and and I want I'm very intrigued to know um how this lends to each other because we kind of are more and more driven to an education system which a lot of people would say is away from quote unquote religion and the church or in 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 beaten different countries the 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 religious institutions and 
in your case, you're looking at, at where you do teach theology and you do also uh, have a lot of expertise in the philosophy of education. So how do those two lend themselves to each other and how, how do you kind of take, uh, you know, the best from both and apply it for your, to your students? <laughs> So, um, in you know, thinking about the, the 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 concept or phenomena of boredom itself, um, you know, there's there's a lot of psychology um, that tries to understand it. But when you trace the lineage and go back further, um, there, it was you know taken up by by theologians and it is today taken up by theologians trying to understand this this mood state. And uh, and so, I think to understand it well, we need to draw on multiple disciplines. And so, I'm looking at at theology, philosophy, psychology. Um, I do think, um, in terms of understanding the world, we do need to we do need to understand the importance of religion and the history of, of, of humanity. And so, you know, just to be, um, you know, thoughtful, uh, it's something that we have to be very sympathetic with and, and, and engage and not and not condescend people who who have religious perspectives, but to but to take them seriously and and and, and in turn ask they take you know secular folks who aren't religious seriously. So I think it's part of. The world we live in it's part of the, the i think the rich diversity uh, uh having this you know all the different religions so i've always been fascinated and for me it comes back to questions about meaning and purpose what is the meaning of life what is the mm. purpose of life and uh religions uh address that directly and so was was drawn to that um as an undergraduate i was a pre-med undergrad i changed my major multiple times but held on to pre-med as kind of a safety you know a kind of a safety uh backup plan but the questions of the humanities and especially theology and philosophy, I just found really compelling because they kept kind of reminding or, or calling me to what, what is the purpose of life? How, how do we live a good and full life? And so those are fundamentally theological questions, religious questions. And so that's what kind of keeps me uh, coming back to that. And when I teach uh, theology classes here, uh, I really am trying to um, excite the students about these questions that I think are existentially significant. You know, what, what, and how you understand the meaning and purpose of life really matters for um, how you live and 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 whether you're going to live a good life uh, and so on. So that's, I'll just start with that for now. Yeah, because there is sort of this undertone now when you say I'm religious, right? And and just to give you context, in in India, it's yeah. a huge population that is religious and religion is something you don't talk about openly because there's a lot of tension when it comes to the Hindus and the Muslims and these these go back hundreds of years right because even within Hinduism they have a lot of sectarian uh, like I wouldn't say like different kinds of subgroups and of course even in Islam you have that um, so the thing is of course uh, understanding of the past religious past is extremely important and I uh, absolutely agree with that but what um, what, what, uh, these these kind of, if, for lack of a better word, the hangover that mm -hmm. has uh, stayed on in these countries, be it whether it's the 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 Middle East and the whole state of Israel, and whether it's mm -hmm. the um, even in America, you have a lot of this um, rejection of religion and a rejection of religion being seen as progressive, saying, you know what, we are better than the old ways. We are atheists and we don't believe in a God and we don't believe in the establishment that the God represents or the uh, institution that represents God. And as a result, we are the people who will take you into the future, which is a lot more liberating for human beings, right? That's one narrative or there are so many of these similar kinds of things and there's a lot of infighting in other cases when you talk about religion. So it's a very, I wouldn't say messy, but it's a very delicate uh, mm -hmm. conversation to have. But at the same time, it's such a deep un understanding. And if you actually look at religion uh, and, this, and I, in my limited knowledge, the, the role it played over the past thousands of years was almost, as you said, th this um, a kind of medium to understand life and make sense of what we are here for and how to take this one life we've been given and live the most but it seems to have kind of been corrupted in some way uh, when we talk about it in modern context yeah i mean i think that's that's um you know i think the early late or the late 19th century there was kind of the the hope or the the progressive enlightened view that once we shed religion and 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 cast it aside we're going to have this enlightened community and society and world. And, you know, there are a number of states that were uh, professedly anti-religious. And, um, you know, I think of um, a friend of mine here studies um, 
um, you know, secular violence. You know, we think of we tend to associate religion and violence. Yeah. But you look at secular states that have committed a lot of violence. And so I think, you know, it really comes back to questions of of, of human nature. Uh, you mentioned the Mideast and, and, you know, to what extent is the politics, you know, the real driving and is the religion then sort of the the, the superficial rationale that gets exploited? Uh, yeah. As, as, yeah. As you suggest. So I think that, you know, human nature is 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 capable of, of incredible acts of, of kindness and love and and violence and and evil. And so uh, and, and religion can get can get played uh, in that in that respect. But I, I don't know that I would point to religion as sort of the the, the, the primal cause for human violence and, and, and our tendency to, to to to, you know, get into conflicts and wars. I mean, I think just the, the 20th century has kind of shown us that um, we've got some fundamental um questions about who we are that we need to, to carefully think through. Um, you mentioned, you know, in India, um, there's a, a group that I think was started in the UK. It's called Scriptural Reasoning, and it brings actually Jews, Muslims, and Christians together to read um, their their texts, their sacred texts together, and, and, and to really reason in a way that isn't trying to um, kind, of, kind of create this sort of veneer of cosmopolitan kumbaya love but let's really look at the differences and right. understand the differences like how do we see that because in some cases they're working from the exact same text certainly in judaism christianity and even in islam and so let's take some of the common texts we have and why do you say that how do you see that and um that's a, a i think a very uh exciting development because i think we we often don't really think through like what what are we what are we really arguing about here um hmm. And yeah, just to add on to that, there's a rejection of this kind of dialogue which is happening because, uh, yeah. as you said earlier, the political motivation to use this as a as a flag or a, a way to kind of inflame the public view is being done politically. And you know, honestly speaking, like there are people across religions in India who see eye to eye on a lot of human issues, right? Whether it's poverty, whether it's um, equality and there's there's the dignity of life but the the problem is when you throw in the mix of this lack of willingness to have dialogue with a sense of political brainwashing of the masses or of the underprivileged or the illiterate in some way and then you have from, from all groups right like there is this thing in India right now where uh, the, the the Muslim population is demanding that there's a different uh, national law for them so they are basically judged under sharia law and the rest of indians fall under the the civil code which is the the the, ju the judicial system etc so like these kinds of things so then automatically people are like why should they have their own rule why should they not be subject to the rule of the land and this is a secular country so j as you just said the secular violence then ensues right but um uh, so, so how how does one even kind of makes sense because when people are not even willing to come to the table to read the text how do you uh, you know break past this this religious intolerance to a larger mm -hmm. scale of people like you and I I'm happy to talk about it I'm happy to even um, mm -hmm. you know evaluate my own religious views or my own ph philosophies but how do you apply that to a larger group of people whether it's a society whether it's a an entire nation hmm. wow that's a big task you've uh, you've charged me with. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I your point about dialogue, I think, is so critical. And I'm I'm thinking about a couple things. I'm thinking about in, in the Catholic tradition. And I'm a Catholic. Um, you kind of are born into these traditions and, and can be quite passive. And then you have to come to a point where is, is this something that I really believe in and, and want to adhere to? But I'm thinking about Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, and he was um, introduced to text uh, by Aristotle from um, Muslim scholars who were reading these texts from ancient Greece about human nature and the purpose. And these texts had a completely entire, entirely different metaphysical outlook on the world. Mm. And yet Islamic scholars and then and, and Catholic scholars, and as well as Jewish scholars back in the 12th and 13th century were just stupefied by the brilliance of this 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 greek like he's he you know he doesn't get everything right but he gets a lot right right and so that capacity to look outside of your own tradition and see insight and wisdom and in practices in another tradition i think is um is really is really key and then aquinas when he begins his big book the summa theologica this, this multi-volume he begins it with you know if 
you've read Aristotle, do we even need Christianity? I mean, Aristotle, I mean, he begins it with a question. Right. And and I think key about that is it's, it's a dialogue. He's beginning a dialogue. Mm. And, and his book is, is one long dialogue after dialogue after dialogue. And it's a dialogue with Aristotle. It's with Averroes. It's with Maimonides. It's, it's with Jewish, Christian, and ancient Greek scholars. And so I think that is the mark of a healthy religion. Yeah. That it, it has a capacity for dialogue. It, it it can I like your point when you began before we were recording, you talked about you're learning to take yourself less seriously. And I think that that's a real grace, being able to laugh at yourself and to take yourself lightly. And that's part of being able to engage in a dialogue. And 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 so when someone questions your view or maybe or maybe you know slightly mocks it, you can you can kind of laugh at it, but then you know, counter back and um and have that that underlying respect. So I think to the extent that religions are anti-dialogical. Um, that's very concerning. I mean, that's what mm. a cult is, right? A cult is trying to indoctrinate and, and and doesn't address difficult questions, actually silences questioning, runs from questioning. Um, so um, I, you asked, how, how do we do this on a large scale? I mean, I think it really starts, um, you know, I tend to be someone who thinks that we got to work within our communities and, and we actually, actually have to meet people, um, you know, from different religious traditions and, and have conversations. I mean, when it's all theoretical and we're just projecting um um we really don't know um you know what we're talking about yeah because i feel when it's a religious practice or a or or, or a philosophy to live your own life or for a community to live a better life cohesively considerately compassionately um that is that becomes a that becomes a value system that can guide you but when it becomes a when it's told to you that it's an identity that's when these problems mm-hmm. come that's when you're not even willing to look past it saying you know what my identity is completely tied up with this religion or this way of life and as a result when that is attacked my life is attacked and that's i think happening a lot over here because it kind of mm-hmm. uh, sells you into this idea that you know what um, your entire existence as an individual and as a group is coming under attack but mm-hmm. the actual text i'm sure you 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 are much more well versed in this will say you know what it's okay as a group yes you are a group of people who belong to this or you 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 kind of um you know um subscribe to this way of thinking because it makes life better and it made the past uh, and your ancestors live better and as a result you will sort of subscribe to this and if if that's the case then you're like you know what maybe there is a better way of living maybe as you know uh, um you know as a muslim i can do yoga it's not uh, you know it's not it's not against my religion so uh, but the i don't think i have a question there but i'm just sort of observing what yeah. ha- is happening around me but that also leads me to ask you um get, do, do you see a change uh in, in, in because you're in america um specific to america or uh, across western countries where people are able to kind of live a hybrid religious uh life where they're able to take I hate this uh, term, but like they use in corporate the best practices and and apply that to their life. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the in the fifties and sixties, uh, I think this is true of of Europe and the United States. This this idea of the secularization thesis that as we become more enlightened, as science continues to create these dazzling new instruments that we can use, um, eventually religion is just going to fade away. And um, that did not happen, uh, certainly not in the United States. Uh, the United States is a is a kind of a religious haunted culture society. However, in the last eight, nine years, there has been a precipitous decline in religious uh, attendance. I mean, certainly mm-hmm. COVID impacted that greatly. So uh, we're kind of in a very interesting moment of, of, of flux where people are are increasingly identifying as they call them knowns they just have no affiliation to any religion whatsoever no. um but you know and i thinking of 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 jewish and 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 catholic i mean there are people that you know there's there's a way of being culturally jewish or catholic where you don't believe in the metaphysics of god and, and god creating the world but i was talking with um uh, a jewish scholar at a conference who said yeah i don't i don't go to i don't go to synagogue i don't i don't believe but I still care about Sabbath. I practice Sabbath. I, mm-hmm. I, I find that to be so important. And so, you know, this this practice is something that he recognizes as just, um, you know, just good for being a human being. You know, having a day where where the economy and work are not completely totalizing your life and you pull back from it. So I think there is there is some of what you're saying where we're trying to 
you know, um, hold on to some of these practices, not because uh, religion told us to do these, but simply because they were they're wise and they actually help mm-hmm. us to live better lives. So, yeah, and I've seen it personally in my family, right? Um, with my grandmom, she it gave a lot of peace. It gave her a lot of uh, mm-hmm. a sense of calmness, a sense, of, you know, it would it would kind of be the thing that um, you can hold on to. And what's wrong with that? Yeah. If it's not hurt, harming anyone, if it's going to give you a sense of kindness, a sense of, you know, awareness of other human beings. And, and I want to ask you about the practices, right? Like, um, whether it's prayer, whether it's service, and as you said, the professor that you met, mm-hmm. the, the Sabbath, and, and, and observing that, or going to mm-hmm. church, or going to the temple. Um, mm-hmm. How much of these things are, um, and because you spoke about boredom being now something essentially that uh, you see as an overlap in a lot of uh, human behavior and our in- inability to either cope with boredom or rather not cope with boredom, but to appreciate boredom, endure boredom, but also be told that, you know, escape boredom. These are big things yeah. that's happening in our technologically supercharged, uh, you know, time. Mm-hmm. So how much of these things like wake up in the morning, have a bath, light a lamp, pray or set flowers or whatever it could be, whatever the practice or the ritual that is thing. How much of these were designed to kind of calm down the mind or to even make your life or your day more, um, to, to start it with a, for like, for, for, for uh, you know, like the American way is hit the road running, right? So how much of oh. these things were to start the day slower to be a little bit more aware of your own mind, your own body, your own physical, mental state, and mm-hmm. how much of those uh, were designed to that, and how much of those um, help? If yeah, well, with you know, you know, I'm thinking of you know, we were you know, 300 years ago, all of us were part of an agrarian kind of culture, you know, that was, mm-hmm. and there were certain rhythms that were were just part of being in an agrarian culture that kind of you know, guided your, your day-to-day activities and rituals. And then, you know, once we became more of an industrialized nation and we developed a light bulb, all of a sudden we could work till one, one in the morning, you know, yeah. uh, just, just the setting of the sun and having to use candlelight just changes and slows down uh, your, your, you know, your rhythms. Um, in the early 20th century, as we had this incredible urbanization happening um, in the U S you know, and, and then at the same time, workers being overworked, overtaxed, and, and needing time off, and they, you know, were fighting to have a weekend. Um, we had a lot of people uh, with free time on their hands and not knowing what to do with themselves. Mm-hmm. And um, in in the early 20th century, in 1918, in the United States, you know, educational scholars are trying to think about this. They actually set out a vision for what human beings need what what do our young people need and 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 there are things like they need career training they need uh civic preparation to be citizens but they also included among the seven objectives they need to know how to have or to use leisure in a worthy way mm-hmm. which is kind of astounding because when you look at educational aspirations or outcomes in our current context the cultivation of 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 noble forms of leisure is just completely absent uh from from the educational vision plan that you see today. And so there really was this recognition that we've lost something critical here, that we, we, we don't know what to do with ourselves. And at the same time you had, you know, rampant alcoholism and prohibition then, you know, in the United States where we just say, you know, we're just going to ban alcohol altogether. We're going to stop the sale of it. Right. And we're trying to figure out how to cultivate good forms of leisure. And, um, you know, that's been marginalized. And I think what's filled that up is, you know, we just, you know, we, 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 you know, Hollywood got going, you know, television, media, all these things that that can can help us alleviate um, our bored selves and and keep us amused and keep us distracted. Um, and that's that's fine. Right. To a point. But there's but there's this other way of being in the world, which I think you're, you're pointing to with these with these rituals that 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 curates or cultivates a different kind of attending and being present in the world in a way that using social media or watching screens passively does not. And so I think that, um, you know, the kind of uh, rituals that you talked about, I think what was happening there, and I don't know that it was necessarily theorized where people like realized what was happening, but what what I think was going on, and I try to talk about this in this this book I got, uh, is is a a way of drawing your attention and and, and keeping it steady. 
mm. and, and really kind of cultivating a deep attending and, and being present in a way that um, boredom avoidance um, um, misses out on. You know, when we're bored, yeah. we're trying to go from one thing to the next to the next. And really what we need to do is just attend to one thing for a while. And, you know, you catch yourself doing that, right? It's so easy to wake up in the morning, look at your phone, send out yep. five emails, and again, think about who you're going to call, think about, but just to get off, mm. not look at your screen and just go sit, whether it's, whether it's, it's you know, you do some breath work or whether it's, you know, and this whole idea, like I, I look at it because it was a lot in my, my, my parents and um, my grandmom when, when I was growing up was this idea that, you know, first thing you do is have a bath, clean yourself. And yeah. it, these are, these are such things that we, you know, I, 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 I didn't reject it, but it didn't really, I didn't really apply it growing up. And then, you know, when I was in college, you know, some, some days you wake up, you're hungover, you have a bath at like a shower at like six in the evening. And you just like, I don't know, as you get older, you realize the value of all these things and why they did it. And, yeah. um, and that's this, that's a strange thing, which, you know, I, I really want to talk to you about today is, um, because even when you, um, address being bored, Mm -hmm. the way it's the way it's addressed or the way it's spoken about like it's a bad thing you know um mm -hmm. but just to take you back like you know the things that i'm just thinking back when i was growing up um in the 90s we didn't you know of course there were video games and there were things it's not like we grew up completely isolated and completely without entertainment but mm -hmm. um i think there was this 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 small kind of uh the, the, these periods in the day during the summer holidays when you didn't really have anything to do and you know everyone was either sleeping because it's hot after lunch and so then you you kind of figure out things right like you either take the pipe and you start playing with water and then someone asks you to stop yeah. it because you're wasting water or or, or yeah. then you kind of just figure out you know what to do like get to get 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 together with other kids or and even some of the best philosophers have come up with the best ideas and this happens not I'm not comparing myself to them but your best thought sometimes is when you are bored and you kind of yeah. look at yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that um, when the bored state hits us, you know, we, we tend to go in two ways. The first way is we just avoid it. We just mm -hmm. find something that's going to, you know, get us out of this uncomfortable state. Um, when my kids were younger, I used to do these technology fasts weekend where I'd say, mm -hmm. you're not going to look at any screens at all. And um, you know, there'd be, a bookcase, there are books there they can look at. We had a, a big, nice backyard they could play. And invariably, you know, my son would come to me and say, dad, I'm so bored, there's nothing to do. And um, right. and there's kind of two things going on there. One is um, really a, a, a lack of imagination. He just could not see anything worthwhile to do apart from screens, mm. apart from, from that very low hanging fruit that kind of stimulates and gives you the dopamine hits. But eventually, after an hour, two hours, what happened was they would start building a fort in the living room. That was a common imaginative activity that they would engage in, which is amazing. You know, they would they would design an entire fort. And so I think I think you're right. Boredom can, if we wrestle with it, lead to these this creativity. And that there's some research that is trying to, you know, um, make this case that it's through our boredom that we become creative. But more often than not, we're bored. It correlates with a lot of other uh, behaviors. I mean, it correlates yeah. with so many negative behaviors. We drink too much, we eat too much, we spend too much, we, you know, we, we idle our time um, in ways that, you know, I, I, I joke in the in this this TEDx talk that I gave that I used to play a lot of Tetris. I mean, I probably yeah. put in what do they say? Is it ten thousand hours that you have to get? To <laughs> yeah, to become I, I probably had my ten thousand hours of Tetris. I got quite good at it, mm. and you know. Um, if I could take that and put it into guitar, you know, it would have been a very different kind of yeah. way to spend time. And for me, it was boredom avoidance. Maybe there's a way of doing Tetris that's leisurely, but for me, it was just, it was a low hanging, easy way to avoid boredom. And, and so while I think boredom can lead to, to creative pursuits, I think what happens though, um, is if we're not careful and we're not attending to it, it can lead us down some really problematic pathways. And this is where I think theology is actually helpful because when you look at the lineage of the word boredom, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, in the Renaissance, the word uh, was in, the, in France was melancholy, which, which literally translates as, as, you know, it's trying to understand it uh, biologically. It means black bile. There was this notion 
or this speculation that we had this substance in our system that was causing us to fill this malaise or this melancholy, which we know is 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 not not the case. But you you go back to the early, you know, two hundreds, and you had you had spiritual monastic writers describing this phenomena as acedia. And acedia was this this sadness of the spirit, this listlessness, this aimlessness. And um, it was considered one of the eight deadly thoughts, which is significant because um, their concern was that to the extent that you're you're falling into acedia, you're on morally precarious ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We do not tend to think about boredom as a morally precarious state today. And I think we should. I think we need to recognize to the extent that we're not aware of our boredom and our boredom avoidance tendencies, we're, we're on some morally um, treacherous uh, ground because it does drive us in ways that are just not um, optimal. So right. go ahead. So, no, so I wanted to ask you, is boredom then a state of inactivity slash no activity and only needs to be a time for reflection on your life? Or is boredom a means to an end? Because it almost uh, feels like uh, any... Uh, see, I mean, I'm not confused, but I'm just intrigued to know. Like, because yeah. it feels like, okay, if you are distracted, then that's kind of boredom avoidance, right? Because then you're going from one thing to another thing because you don't yeah. want that gap of silence or gap of lack of activity. But, um, so what exactly is boredom then? It, 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 can, yeah. yeah, maybe that's something which I'd like to yeah. understand. That's great. You're asking me to define. What am I talking about here? Um, uh, boredom simply is a state of disinterest. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're and, it, and there's, you know, it, it gets parsed in different ways, but, but two of the fundamental ways, and, and this is, this is Heidegger talking about this difference between situational boredom and existential boredom. Right. So situational boredom is I'm in a situation, I'm in a class and I'm bored by the teacher. Mm -hmm. and it's a boring class or I'm reading a boring book. And it's a situation that has kind of a, a, a limits to it. Once this class ends, I will be out of this bored state. Um, but it's important to note that that it's not an objective uh, uh, state. And we tend to think about it objectively. And we tend to we tend to say that's a boring person or a boring book, as mm -hmm. if boredom is, is somehow in the object. But it's right. But in fact, it's it's our subjective assessment of a situation. Mm -hmm. And we know that you know I I don't, I don't find. The game of chess to be particularly interesting right. uh, i think it's kind of boring right um but i think that's a character flaw in me because i have friends who love chess and 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 say no, no no if you if you attend to it you will see the magic and and wonder and strategy but, and, and, sorry is that a flaw or is that just what makes you you and makes you identify with say uh someone like me who will say oh man i don't like chess either let's go play tennis you know what i mean it, it, yeah, why, why is yeah. it perceived as a flaw yeah. Yeah, are you a tennis player, by the way? No, I, I used to love tennis, but then when I was when I was eight, I I lost uh, okay. my central vision to a, a genetic disorder. But I love the game. I love, okay. uh, but now I can't watch it because it's just like men grunting, and I can't even see the balls. I'm like, yeah, I'll just watch golf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I, I I too love tennis. So you you right. you, distra you distracted me in a good way when you brought up tennis. Right. As, right. As, yes, you know, I think that part of the issue though is. When we're bored situationally, we, we can make a snap judgment about an activity, a person, a book, mm -hmm. and 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 miss something that might actually be genuinely interesting to us if we stay yeah. with it for a while. I mean, everything, anything good requires pushing through the lulls. You know, certainly to get good at a language or an instrument or a sport, you have to drill, and drills are repetitive and tedious. So I think, I think to your point, I think yeah, there can be. I'm I'm more interested or drawn to tennis than chess, but my bored mind um, doesn't give chess a chance. It, it, it just, it writes it off too quickly. Uh, and that's, that's the situational boredom. The existential boredom that Heidegger talks about is, is more profound. It's, it's really, you're bored with, with life. You know, you, you can't really find anything that really sustains your, your interest. And, right. and kind of a simple example that I use, I don't know if you've ever, you know, you have Netflix there, I presume. Of you, course, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when you open up Netflix and you see a thousand different movie titles and just nothing interests you, like I'm mm. just not drawn to anything, which is kind of amazing. You know, there's an in, almost not almost an infinite amount of of op options there, and yet 
you know, you just feel like I'm just not really. And so that's kind of a, a, a whiff of existential boredom. Uh, so, so boredom is this state of, of disinterest and it's, it's characterized by um, um, restlessness and it, it can also be characterized by a lack of agency where you're stuck. I cannot not figure out what to do to get out of this, this state. And so when you think about students in a board class, um, what concerns me is, is the, you know, I mentioned there's avoidance, but on the other hand, there's a resignation to the board state. And I've, you know, visited a lot of classrooms as a teacher and you'll see students in classrooms that are, that I think are incredibly boring and they're just completely docile and passive. And you, you would hope that they, they would be misbehaving or that they would be doing something on the sly, you know, and, and oftentimes they're just completely kind of almost vacant and they've just kind of been, and I think, I think there are workplaces that do this to us that are very boring and, and you just learn how to be in this very resigned kind of state. Um, and not really be kind of, don't put your head above water because you might get called out. So just kind of just ride the wave kind of, right. uh, yeah, being kind of, yeah, that's, yeah. And you know, the, so, sorry if I interrupted mm -hmm. your thought, um, because it fine? kind of leads me into this this space, which is, you know, is it good to be bored, and maybe how much uh, is it how how much boredom in a day is it healthy for a person to to experience? I think it's good to protect our attention. And um, we we tend to set ourselves up, you know, we have a restaurant here called Buffalo Wild Wings. <clears throat> when you walk to Buffalo Wild Wings, there's 40 t television screens and each screen has something different on it. Ooh, and, okay, okay. and and you're, you're there with your friends, but behind your friends and literally all around you, 360 are screens, each flashing some sporting, usually sporting events. Right. And um, I think that's kind of how we live our lives now. Um, mm -hmm. where we're trying to have a conversation and there's, there's screens all around us and our attention is just, we're just setting ourselves up to have short attention, to be distracted from distraction by distraction. And so I think what, what we, you know, what, what I, when I'm at my best, I'm actually removing all those screens and, and I'm trying to just attend to one thing. And so putting my phone off, off to the side, literally going for a walk where all I have is a book or I'm, I'm trying to play you know i play amateur poor guitar but just doing that for, for mm -hmm. 20 minutes just doing that in a way that um prevents me from being interrupted um i think i think that's the kind of um so boredom will come during those spaces of time it might come um but but the bored mind just wants to quickly jump from whatever it is you're doing to something else and so i, I do think it's 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 a state that comes up um, that we need to learn to recognize and push past to get to better things because you don't really enjoy something unless you actually stick with it for a while. Um, you know, learning, as I said, learning something new, uh, initially it can be boring, but it's not until you get some proficiency at it that you realize, oh, this is actually way more enjoyable. And you mentioned the game of tennis. Mm -hmm. Starting out, you know, tennis is just miserable. I mean, you know, it's sort of fun, but you're kind of but, but it's not until you've done those drills that you get to this higher level and can appreciate just how 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 incredible the game is yeah it's it's true because it almost um sounds like you know everyone like even today it's it's like you have to pack your day with you know a list a to do list a goals five year yeah. goals or um yeah. you know perform, peak perform, improving on yourself it's, but can boredom you know because I've heard a few people talk about anxiety as a system built into you to tell you that there's something about the way you're thinking or the way you're living your life that is not working for you. And maybe you should look at your um, look within or just take take stock of what's going on and maybe change a few things or maybe address a few things, maybe uh, past yeah. patterns or past thoughts. So can boredom be a gauge of how we're engaging with um, the world around us? Uh, could be the way we are looking at the world, our perspective, but maybe also the way we are uh, putting across our intention, the way we are kind of coming across with the, the work we do or the, the things we say. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result, kind of be a, a, a check and balance for that. 
I, I think it can, uh, but I think I think here's the, the distinction. I mean, boredom is a, a mood state. When you think of other mood states, you mentioned anxiety. I'm thinking of anger and fear. So we get angry or we, we experience fear. And and oftentimes there's a, a clear object of, of I'm angry at this person who cut me off in traffic. Yeah. Um, and then we, we have to figure out how to regulate our response to the anger state. Um, you know, if we overreact... Um, I was watching this show on Netflix um, called The Beef, and it, it begins with a road rage incident, and it, mm. and it just goes from there. And, and this rage just continues from episode to episode. And mm. and I brought it up just because it's an example of how, you know, th- this mood state, the mood state of anger, it, it's so clear that we need to get a handle on it. The difference between the mood state of anger and fear or anxiety and boredom is boredom tends to fly under the radar. Mm. Um, we tend to be navigating away from boredom without even realizing we're doing it. So to your point, could boredom actually be an indicator uh, that, you know, maybe this isn't the right job. Maybe this relationship I'm in is just not, a, you know, it's not, it's not a good fit for me. Mm. And I, you know, instead of taking time to think about that, we tend to have a knee jerk response, which is avoidance or resignation. Right. And so, you know, taking time to, all right, what, what is going on here? Am I really bored by the game of chess or do I need to attend a bit more and stay with it? And then over time, I might realize that, you know, I think it's a fine enough game, but I'm not going to cultivate the game of chess. I'm going to work on, on something else. Um, the, you know, so I think it can be an indicator of that, or, you know, we get bored and we just go down a lot of other different pathways, you know, and I, I mentioned, you know, just, the, the negative behaviors that are causally correlated with boredom uh, can take up a lot of bandwidth in our in our in our living. It's almost like boredom is an opportunity to, for you as an individual to ask the right questions, as opposed to just looking for the answers. I, I think that's right. I mean, I think you know, going back to the this older conception of of boredom, and I mentioned the the notion of acedia is. It's not a trustworthy mood state. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. And we tend to, we tend to just trust it. I'm bored by this person or by this book. And you know, there were books that I found boring that I now realize no, that's a that's actually an incredible book. And it, and, and yeah. it, my bored state, I shouldn't have tr- I, I shouldn't trust it. Right. So just to yeah, I mean absolutely right because if I just sometimes uh, you know early on someone would say let's go watch this play and I'm like You're crazy a play. I, um, mm-hmm. but I actually went. So the point I'm trying to kind of get to is that if you can get past that first knee jerk reaction of it's dismissal, right? I yep. think then it leads you to maybe pondering, oh, maybe, you know, maybe chess ain't that bad. Why are so many people doing it? So it could be if you push past it and it looks like the things that help you push past the initial knee jerk, negative avoidance mm-hmm. or submission to boredom, a uh, couple of things are discipline and purpose, right? If you're disciplined, mm-hmm. Uh, you, you're able to kind of get through that first, you know, the fugue, if you want to call it, or that first um, way to say, oh, I'm going to, you know, th- there's boredom, I'm going to turn right, it's it's a, like a dead end, which I'm going to turn right and run straight to the phone or run straight towards um, negative thinking or what, whatever it could be, the coping mechanism for boredom. But um, yeah, how important is it? Because, you know, uh, if, if a kid now at the age of nine goes on Instagram or goes on TikTok, it seems like no one is bored. It seems like the life these people are living is just perfect, right? It's like real to real to real. Yeah. So how do they yeah. develop this idea, okay, to appreciate that there is a, a going to be phases, going to be times yeah. in the day when you're bored, when no one's there to engage with you, but yeah. you don't have to get on social media to kind of be told that everyone else except you is uh, not bored. What are some of the things that uh, at a young age, because, you know, it's not something that uh, ends today, ends tomorrow. It's not like it's not like puberty. It's not like, you know, menopause at 45. You're no longer going to be bored. Uh, So so how does someone develop these these uh, I wouldn't say value system, but this appreciation of what boredom is? And because we tell kids don't get unnecessarily angry, control your anger or or understand where anger is coming from, where your fear is coming from. But we never tell anyone how to look at boredom yeah i mean i think parents can feel a lot of anxiety about their kids being bored and and take the burden it's the parent's job to keep their kids from getting bored which Mm -hmm. which is really real real problematic because it's it's a mood state that each of us has to 
figure out and contend with uh, ourselves. Um, I, you know, I think that I think we need to we need to talk about boredom. We need to we we need to actually educate children about the bored state. We tend not to talk about it at all. When my son was in kindergarten, uh, first day he walks into class, and on on each of the tables, this was about ten years ago now, there were iPads four iPads. And, and the teacher on day one was already communicating that we're going to have this, this, you know, screen here to engage with, to do the learning, which I, you know, I, I think is oftentimes just a, a teacher trying to outwit or outrun boredom through technology. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, I used to take my kids to the beach and when they were three and five, all they needed was a shovel and a bucket. Yeah. Yeah. They would just be wrapped for two hours. You know, so I think that naturally children actually have a propensity for sustained attention in very simple, wonderful things. And, and culturally we, 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 we condition that out of them, you know, yeah. when, when we, when we draw them into this kind of uh, uh, kind of artificial construct world um, that, you know, kind of kind of gives them dribs and drabs of attention and dopamine and all this stuff. Um, so I think that we actually instinctually, crave and desire, you know, sustained, meaningful attention. So whenever I see a, a child, you know, just doing art and being mesmerized, engrossed in that for 20 minutes, that's gold. I mean, that's that's a human being and their mind is completely wrapped with something. Um, and, and it's not just a passive kind of attention. It's it's an active kind of attention. And I think what, what happens with boredom avoidance is it draws us into this sort of passive consumption to just kind of... Um, kind of veg out, you know, I just want yeah. to veg out. I just, I just want to relax, have a drink and veg out versus um, leisure. Going back to this early vision of, of education, cultivating leisure. It's not work where you have to be on You're kind of, you know, focused leisure is doing something that requires an attention, but it also, it also involves being kind of receptive um, at the same time. And it, and, and there's a kind of a renewing uh, uh, renewing process to it. So I think we need to educate this in schools. We need to talk about it. We need to we need to be explicit about it. You know, when I teach uh, students in my classes, I'll tell them, look, it, 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 there's going to be stretches that you might feel boredom. But trust me, if you push through this, you're going to get to this higher level. And I, I do think when teachers build trust with students, they can they can actually leverage that trust to say you, you've got to push through the boredom state. Don't trust, don't trust the boredom state. Trust, trust this, this guy who's helping you. You know, I have a friend who used to invite me to go on walks. I don't like walking. I find it kind of boring. And having done it multiple times I, and, and realizing just sort of the benefits of this, it's like, well, we actually have a really good conversation. I feel, you know, it's just good to get out of my office. Um, I've come to realize, you know, there's something here in this very simple practice that is leisurely and not, not boring at all. Yeah, I mean, I totally resonate with that idea, right? Like, you know, when uh, about four or five years back when I was actively doing shows, um, I was listless the whole day. And then I would just use alcohol as a way to kind of escape that quote unquote boredom. And now when, you know, post lockdown, I've kind of realized to appreciate it. I do it like having a few beers, but it's more leisure because during that time I'm reading a book, listening to a podcast. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm just trying to understand, like, is there, like, someone could argue that, hey, you know, Kevin, that's not fair on someone who uh, will 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 kind of watch YouTube videos and that's their leisure. Or um, why should it be only a walk? Or why should it be playing um, an instrument or or gardening, yeah. right? Why, why can't it be technologically um, driven as well? Yeah, that's a great, great question uh, that comes up a lot. And so it's, it's kind of... Um, you know, I, I do think there's these three kind of spheres and I'm imagining like the not imagining, but thinking about the work sphere where you're on mentally on. And then the other sphere is amusement and amusement tends to be and I'm, I'm speaking very broadly and I'm generalizing. I know yeah. it tends to be more of a passive receiving, you know, so I, I was watching the beef last night, just sitting there are taking it in, you know, and, and then I would, I like to watch, you know, tennis highlights. And I was just watching some tennis highlights. And so I'm just passively taking it in. And, and I think, I think that's fine, but we tend to just have those be the dominant spheres. I'm working, working, working. I'm engaging in amusement or I'm, I'm receiving amusement. And, and, and I, I too like to have a drink. And so 
I'm scrolling and I'm having a drink. And, and those tend to be just the two dominant ways of being that kind of play off each other. I'm exhausted by work and I need amusement to kind of relax and to recover and to get you know prepared so I can go back to work. Mm. The other sphere, and this is going back to Aristotle and, and this idea of Sabbath is cultivating leisure. And I think what's different about leisure is it's not just passive. There's something active and passive about it work is all active amusement is all passive leisure's got an active passive dynamic to it and so i i think you know could youtube be leisure i don't i don't know that i mean perhaps if you're if you're someone who just studies the the way people make youtube and videos and you know there might there might be a way that it could be more active it tends to be at least my experience a much more passive kind of experience in right. a way that playing an instrument or a sport or um, going for a walk is is just, just there's just more active and passive going on there. So I think mm-hmm. that's the key distinction. And so I'm not arguing to drop all amusement. You, you should never you know look at at YouTube, um, but but to recognize that there are these other ways of being that are are restorative. I think in a in a in a really fundamental way. You know, there's a strange uh, thought that came into my head, not strange in that way, but mm-hmm. when um, so a lot of my um, entertainment, a lot of my reading is done on Audible, right? Audiobooks. And so mm-hmm. even there are times when I catch myself having these experiences where, um, and I try to make an effort nowadays to have books across uh, three things, right? One is just absolute entertainment, right? Absolute, um, you know, yeah. the thing where like, even within yeah. like say action and thriller, it could be, something like, you know, a Baldacci or a um, Tom Clancy, right? Like, which is just running, 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 running. It's like watching, it's like watching something on Netflix or Amazon, which is just fast paced. And then the other kind of book is, it could be action thriller, but there's obviously, um, it's like say historical fiction. So in that, um, it's written, like say, Connie Gilden's written about Caesar. So in that, yeah, it is um, uh, fiction, but there's a lot of fact in it. So I'll probably soak in a little bit about Rome and about how the Roman Empire was built. And that is, yeah. I would say, leisure for me in some way. And and then there's there's something like reading, uh, le- listening to lectures by Osho or listening to a book by mm-hmm. Vivekananda. Or something. And that is, um, I'll have to pause every yeah. uh, minute, minute or two to, to absorb that passage. So it's intriguing that, you know, uh, because just... I, you know, I don't want to dismiss it going, oh, I sit the whole day and read. And some people would probably look at me. I'm sitting in my room, lying down with headphones on. And I do this for six hours a day. So I'm like, is this a bad thing? Is this is this me avoiding living? <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I, I like the distinctions you're making within the kind of reading you're doing, though. I mean, I think, as you said, there's different kinds of things going on. However, I do think the act of reading requires there's a you know we have to use our imaginations when we're reading you know the yeah. words are painting a picture that we're having to imagine in a way that watching something it just does it all for you you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i think that reading has um has greater potential for leisure to me than um scrolling facebook reels does yeah <laughs> far, far far you know requires more a bit more um, and I feel more anxious because sometimes I get on that bandwagon, right? Like uh, I'll check Instagram once in a while to see if anyone's messaged or, and then a friend sent a reel and then you're just flicking, flicking, flicking. And even with YouTube, yeah. you know, I love, um, I mean, I shouldn't do it because it completely ruins my golf swing. When I watch these golf instructional videos, everyone has the answer to the easiest swing. And sometimes yeah. I watch it in with the intent of like, okay, where in the backswing am I making a mistake? But then the next thing you know, you're clicking on the PGA tour, who won the first round highlights, second round highlights, sir. And then you're just saying, oh, which, there's a new car out, Genesis sponsored this, and you're watching the Genesis car review. Oh, yeah. That is oh, mindless. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just goes and goes and goes. Yeah, and and uh, it's it's so enticing, isn't it? I mean, it's just, yeah. yeah. Just, it's, it's um, you know, the, our kids are, the younger generations are drawn into it. You know, but, but my my parents... They're worse than my kids. They're constantly on their phones and absolutely, and yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just and you know the thing is, it's it like I have a my daughter just turned one, and you know the the thing is we we the moment they come to people come to visit her in five minutes of meeting her they're like oh say hello say hi whatever and and they shove a phone in her face to take a photo, and 
I've yeah. noticed this with her, right? Like when in the past few months, she's her her development is quite amazing, right? Just to and and a lot yeah. of toys, and we've taken a lot of hand me downs, and we we you know we just kind of have these baskets of toys, and we just let her play. And I made it a habit now that every time I sit with her, I play music, right? Whether it's um, um, hard rock, classic rock, or whether it's it's the Chili Peppers, or whether it's Rihanna, there's some music playing. And she just is absorbed by it. She loves music, listening to music. I don't know if she actually likes it or she's just like, oh, God, this playlist again. But um, she doesn't engage with the toys all the time. Sometimes she'll just take a piece of thread or she's sitting on my lap. We're sitting and looking at the sort of uh, neighbors and the, the houses around. And she's just captured by that, captivated by that. And she doesn't need the toys. But we almost feel like we're doing an injustice to her by not giving her toys, you know? Yeah, it is it is strange. Um I mean, I mentioned again, the, being at the beach with sand in a bucket. I mean, it, or just, just sand, just starting to build stuff. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It's, it's like, it's like it, we, we can't let, let them be in that. No, no, no. Here, let me give you this, this, this thing here, you know, to, to enhance it somehow or to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And no, since I, I was really sort of torn, like, what do I get her for her first birthday, which is, you know, May 11th. Um, and I was like, okay, you know, she'll be I should be the dad who gets the biggest stuffed toy, the cutest dress. Yeah. Then I was like, you know what? I ended up buying her a little wooden xylophone because it's something she can engage with. It's it's not got electronics. It's not got anything. It's just yeah. wood, a wooden kind of mallet, and it's got these colored notes. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe because um, I was musically motivated. I never had the discipline to get past, as you said, that initial thing. So I would, you know, the guitar teacher would teach me these chords. And then I'm like, but when can I play Wonderwall? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah it's so amazing when you break past that repetition of playing you know say your your scales for half an yeah. hour there's something which is rewarding which may not be the song but the the fluidity of your fingers moving there's something which if you learn to kind of take a step back and appreciate then you're not so keen on just playing in a band you know yeah well i think that's the key you know, with sports and um, other activities where we're, we're just so bent on improvement and excellence and, and, and winning that we, we don't actually appreciate, you know, I used to play a lot of basketball um, mm. a few years ago and, um, and I'm not a very good basketball player, but I so enjoyed playing basketball. You know, there, there are these yeah. intrinsic goods to the activity apart from wins or recognition, which I got none of yet really any, but but cultivating an appreciation for the very goods of the practice, you know, that's a gift that you take with you, you know, yeah, for the rest yeah. of your life. You know, there are just certain activities you realize, well, why are you doing that? Like, like, that's a silly question. I mean, you know, why am I reading a book? Why am I playing basketball? Why am I swinging a golf club? Yeah. There's just something intrinsically enjoyable about these activities um, that competition and 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 the kind of the drive for excellence sometimes can eclipse that and, and and keep us from seeing that. And that's you know such a perfect way of saying it because you know when I was when I was like fourteen I I started playing golf back with the intention of doing some sport that I, that I can do which is uh, as a visually impaired person I could manage somehow I could see the ball but now you know I stopped because I I couldn't hit the ball like when I was maybe in you know early two thousands I was like what is this sport or maybe. And now I've revisited um, visited it with the true appreciation of not to get to the golf course. I've, I've been I've taken it up over the past now almost uh, two two and a half years, and I've probably gone to the course once, but I go to the range three times a week. The the act of you know people are like you hit two hundred balls. What's wrong with you? What are you what are you aiming to do? Like I'm yeah. like I want to enjoy that feel. You know that ball when it hit when I hit it well. I want to recreate that feel, and I want to do it again, and I want to do it again. And I I don't know if it's going straight. I don't know if it's getting a left to right fade or right to left draw. I don't care. But the feeling gives me so much pleasure, and yeah. time just goes by. And I I don't you know sometimes I like I don't know if I'll get to the course anytime soon. But the moment that thought of when you're going to get to the course enters your head, it becomes yeah. uh, not enjoyable. You know for me. Yeah, no, I, I hear that. G.K. Chesterton has this great quote, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. And, right. uh, you know, <laughs> I, I've played enough golf and, you know, when you hit a clean swing, it, it just, mm. it's just a beautiful feel. And and when yeah. you don't hit a clean swing, it's just, it's ugly. It's just, yeah. ugh. You know? And I can't even see the ball. For me, it's just the feel. And the, now I've got the confidence of just standing there and just swinging. And you kind of 
because I'm not focused on the ball and where it's going, mm-hmm. I can feel other things in my body, in my the way my 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 uh, shoulder moves or how there's certain balancing which is off, and it's quite remarkable. I'm not sorry going on. I'm going on about this, but it's just. Yeah, it's it's something which I never thought I'd come back to, but I did have these hours of listlessness when I didn't have activities like this. And for a for a time in the lockdown, I did take up a little bit of guitar lessons, and I did have uh, I did enjoy it. I just didn't stick with it. But this is giving me that kind of thing which you say it's that um, enjoyment, but at the same time involvement. You know. Yeah, yeah, and I, I do think that's that's. Uh, I, I, I describe this as cultivating leisure. And again, there's this active passive dynamic. It's not work. It's not amusement. It's, it's this other sphere. And these kinds of activities I think are, are just critical uh, to, to human flourishing to cultivate these kinds of activities. Uh, and, and to, you know, I, I, in my own boredom avoidance over the years, I just spent my time just doing a lot of things that I really didn't even enjoy that much, you know, and, and so cultivating leisure is, is really making time to, 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 to pursue the things that you do enjoy. And just before we wind up, because I think we're mm-hmm. um, going forward with everything we do have right now with the, and I kind of come back to this in, in, in more episodes than I maybe should, mm-hmm. uh, is kind of go down the conversation of AI and AI companions and AI assistants and um, mm-hmm. with, with, with a increasingly, um, you know, h- higher signs of a technologically dominant world. Um, mm-hmm. What are some of the positive ways to engage with boredom? And what are some of the, and you've spoken about this, of course, but if you could just give a few mm-hmm. things that you've seen, observed, and also kind of applied to students or to children um, mm-hmm. that can help people cope with this and make sense, some sense of the madness or, or appreciate that they're already doing. Uh, in terms of, you mean the impact of AI? With respect I mean, to I think, no, so, just as we're getting more and more overwhelmed by this and we hear more and more AI is going to take over your job or AI is the best thing that happened. Yeah. So I'm saying yeah. some of the practices, if you want to call it, or some yeah. of the activities yeah. that you've seen that helps people yeah. uh, take a step back and just, you know, breathe. Yeah. Well, I do think, you know, being in, in education, um, I do think the AI, the emergence of AI in the last five, six months with Chat GPT. I'm I'm excited because it's really brought to the fore the question of what it means to be human, mm-hmm. uh, which is is the question for the humanities. I mean that's that's what the humanities is always trying to remind us of. Are we losing our humanity? Right. Uh, the extent that um, technology becomes more advanced, uh, how are we? And and I think that you know with some of the the writing that I see AI doing, and I've read and I've I've played around with it. Um, it's 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 functional it's effective but it but it doesn't have a distinctive human voice it, and i don't know maybe it'll get more sophisticated and i'll get fooled by it but right now it it, it seems to be kind of a middling kind of uh, mm. aggregator of of you know information that it can pull from from a variety of sources so i think the question of what it means to be human is 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 clear is clearer and 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 sharpening its focus because of this technology which i think is a very good thing for uh, the humanities and, and 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 for all of us, as we we think about this more critically, um, it, just in terms of you know my my larger project of, of boredom, uh, the the simple thing that I, I come back to is um, is um, protecting our attention and 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 reflecting on, on on the boredom mood state and 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 you mentioned like what is it teaching us? What does it have to, to tell us? I think there is something there, but it's not it's not a, a a quick read. It's not like a an indicator in your car where you need gas, or you need oil, or you need air in your tires. The boredom light goes on, and it's not quite clear what it's directing us to. And so, needing to to slow down. And I think one of the ways we can contend with boredom well is cultivating these these thoughtful forms of leisure, which really do require us to to step back from, um, you know. I don't know if you saw the social dilemma a few years ago uh, on 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 Netflix. Yeah, yeah, um, I did, I did. Yeah, and it just showed you how um, just how good um, the engineers, Google and, and Facebook and whatnot, are how good they are at capturing our our our, our brains and keeping them on screens. And so I, I think we're we're kind of not kind of we're battling this this addiction that's ca- it's been a tsunami that swept over 
all the generations. And so right. we need to create these spaces where we can reclaim our attention for cultivating meaningful forms of leisure, I think is, is a critical project for what it means to be a human being right now. That's brilliant. Kevin, that's been, it's, it, thank you, um, because it's been such a pleasure talking to you and hearing your, um, you know, I, I, I think it just makes so much sense to, to kind of, to kind of look at the things that you've spoken about, uh, because it, I mean, that's the thing that we truly can only say that we have is being human and the human experience. And it seems that that's the thing we're running away from more and more. So, um, thank you. I, I think for all the great work you've done. And of course you do have a book, if you could tell people where they can find it and, um, sure. where they can reach out yeah. to you at. I will hold up a copy of it here. Why boredom matters. And it is on Amazon. So it is, uh, uh, a click away. So I hope, I hope folks will, uh, will buy it. Thank yes, you so much. The link. For having me. Yeah. No, my pleasure, Kevin. It was actually something that I've been looking at as well, you know, because we all get bored and, you know, the religion is something that's demonized and it's also glorified. It's there's so much noise around it. So it's, it's really, really fantastic to have someone like you who's kind of in these overlapping paths and giving your um, expertise and your perspective on that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be with you. You too. Take care.